Jesus calls us to act with justice, to love tenderly, to walk humbly with God, and serve one another. In yes. answering his call, we express our faith daily through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We answer God's call in so many ways. Some are called to be preachers, others to be teachers. Some are called to be comforters, others to be healers. Some are called to lead, others to organize. Some are called to share casseroles, amen. Others are called to drive nails. Some are called to sing, all are called to pray. Thank you, Lord, for giving us all a job to do for your kingdom. We pledge to use our skills, talents, and gifts to serve you and bless our community. Let's pray. Loving God, we come before you with hearts ready for worship and spirits eager to serve. We gather as your people, each of us uniquely gifted to work for your kingdom. As we enter into this time of worship, remind us that no task is too small, no calling too insignificant when done in your name. Inspire us by the example of Christ who came not to be served, but to serve. May this time of worship renew our commitment to your mission and equip us for the work that lies ahead. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, I won't give this one while I pick this one. But I may quit here and there. So here we go. <coughs> Oh, 
to maintain his certification as a licensed local pastor here in the United Methodist Church. And I'm always telling him to try to find a way that I can help him with his workload. And about three months ago, he handed me a book by an author that he knows I love. And he said, why don't you read it, take some notes, and then that'll help me write my paper when it's time. And those of you that have sat with me in class know when I take notes, I take notes. I highlight and underline and I just rewrite everything for myself. And I was excited after seven of these courses, this is number eight, uh, he finally found a way that I could help him. And if you've ever read a book by Barbara Brown Taylor, you know she has a very unique writing style. And I was excited to just jump in and get started. And as usual, her book did not disappoint, and I found myself underlining and highlighting and taking notes galore. And more than once, I ran back to Craig's office there at the house to share some bit of information I found interesting. I always wonder if he can hear me coming. But I just tromp down the hallway and stick my head in there to see if he's busy or not, and he probably thinks, oh, Lord, here she's back. But it's probably, I always think he, he probably already knows these things, but it's just stuff I have to tell somebody, I have to share, and he's just my victim, I suppose. In several spots in the book, I wrote out in the margins that this chapter would make a really good sermon, Craig. Famous last words of the fool right there. <laughs> so when we found out several weeks ago that he needed gallbladder surgery, and we started thinking about what surgery week was going to look like for him, we realized, number one, he wasn't going to feel like writing a sermon, and number two, probably not feel like standing up here for 15 or 20 minutes. So Craig says to me on one of those little trips back there to his office, hey, remember that book you read for my class? Why don't you take one of those sections and make a sermon out of it? And the moral here is, be careful what you suggest. <laughs> Only I tell him I can't think of it as a sermon. I, it's more of a TED Talk, if you're familiar with what TED Talks. My, this is a Pam Talk, so I don't do sermons. It's just, a, it's just a little, just us having a chat. I'm excited and I'm humbled to be here in this spot. I've always had the gift of gab. For those of you that know me well, you know that. I never seem to be able to organize my thoughts the way Craig does. So I hope that something I say this morning is meaningful to you. The book that I read for Craig was called The Preaching Life, and it was filled with stories about the different ministries that God calls each of us into. And I was really intrigued by the idea that you and I, we're just the lay people of the church. How can we be considered ministers? That is way, way above my pay thing. We think that that's Craig's job. He's the minister of this church. But however, if you look inside your bulletin, if you notice at the top, one of the first things it says is the ministers, who are they? Who are the ministers of this church? All of us, the congregation of LWUNC. We are all ministers. <clears throat> one of the stories that I read in the book was about a young man that wanted to become an ordained minister but he did not want to serve in a church 
or be held accountable by a denomination. So someone asked, well, why do you want to become an ordained minister then? And he said, well, so if I sit down next to someone and they ask me about Jesus, I'll have the credentials to talk to them about Jesus. Well, God help the church if the clergy members are the only people that have the credentials to talk about Jesus. And God help all the troubled people if they have to wait for an ordained person to sit down beside them and talk to them about Jesus. And that's where we come in, us just plain old lay folk. Barbara Brown Taylor says that in many ways, those people who pursue full-time ministry take the easy way out. They picked a role for themselves that allows them to be easily identified as a servant of God. But for us, the people who just sit in the pews every Sunday, our role is not as easy to identify. We kind of straddle the fence between church life and secular life. Our focus here this morning is to define what our role, <clears throat> excuse me, as church members or lay people is. Did you know that ministry is really just being who you already are and doing what you already do, except with one difference, that you understand you are God's person in the world? Somehow, we lay people have this strange notion that clergy people are the only ones that can be trusted with the ministry of the church. What we need to understand is that what we do outside the doors of this church, as a teacher, a business owner, a retiree, a factory worker, those are our places of work, our office. And it's the things we do in our little corner of the world. And no job is any dearer to the heart of God than another. However, we all have different offices. We share that same vocation the one to which we're called at baptism. No matter where our places of work are in the world, our shared vocation is to serve God through them. For instance, Craig's got an office here at church. And after years of having a school building as my place of work, my current office is at home. And that was a big change, to go from having a place where you're needed and you're seen every day to sitting at home. But that's where I'm needed right now. Both of us share a common vocation, to be God's person in our corner of the world, wherever that might be. And our baptism, that's our ordination, that moment that sets us apart as God's people to share in Christ's ministry, whether or not we ever have to stand up here and preach. It's simply a matter of learning to see our lives as an, in a different way. As ordinary lay people, we have to believe in our own ability to serve God and acknowledge the extraordinary dimensions of our ordinary plain old lives. We have to see the hand of God at work in the world and see our own hands as his instruments. I will never forget my mother-in-law. She knew her office was in the kitchen, telling me that when she washed dishes, she prayed for the people that had used the cups and the plates and the forks. That was a mind-blowing conversation one Sunday afternoon after dinner. And when she folded her laundry, she prayed for the people that wore those clothes. And at Loretta's funeral here a few weeks ago, they brought up the memory of she had kept the grandkids a lot. And so many times when they showed up after work to pick up the kids and take them home, she met them at the door, not just with the grandkids, but, oh, I happen to have a roast or a meatloaf. And I can't tell you how many times Craig's mother did that. You show up after a day of work and you're exhausted and you're dragging two little kids behind you. And she says, by the way, here's your supper, you know, just in case you need it and you don't have anything. Because you see, whether your hands are diapering an infant, which I seem to be doing a lot of these days, <laughs> fixing a car, taking care of a business, those hands are God's hands. They were claimed by him at your baptism for the accomplishment of his will here on earth. And believe it or not, this I love this part. This is from one of our Sunday school lessons. God does not retire his people. He might change your vocation. He might change your circumstances. But he always has crucial, important work for us to do no matter our age. 
And you've heard Craig talk about the process he went through when he became a pastor here at Lake Wapapella. God used so many of you, people right here in this church, it opened so many doors that we knew this was our place. And we all know that finding the right pastor for a congregation is a monumental, divine, and difficult task. And then we just get so accustomed to hearing that person preach and seeing that person stand up here that it's easy to forget he's not the only minister in this church. And we have to also remember that preaching is not something that a minister does for 20 minutes on Sunday morning, but something we should all be doing all week long. Barbara Brown Taylor also tells us that it's best not to be too formal about these things. And you all are so good at this part. We humans always tend to complicate things and we make Jesus hard to find. But how wonderful it is to know that Jesus can be found inside a green leaf. It was a butterfly for us this week. I was sitting on the porch swing with baby Monica Grace and a big old yellow butterfly flew by and that was just it. She could see that and that was God for us that day. You know, that's where we saw him. Clean sheets. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Clean sheets. There's nothing better than clean sheets on a bed. How about on a boat on a golf course or in a baby's smile? And our altar doesn't have to be up here at the front of the church. Sometimes your best altar is at your dining room table, or in your kitchen, or in the car, or in the garden. And as lay people, our sacraments are simple. We don't have to wait on the bread and the drink once a month. Our friends, our family, our home, those <coughs> things in nature, those are the things that connect us to God, and there is no end to them. And we have to remember that our pastor, Craig, uses his ministry in established patterns because it's his job to do so. But as lay people, we have to remember that our worship tells us the household of God was not meant to stay in this house. The church is where we learn who and whose we are, and the world is where we put that knowledge to use. And let's never lose sight of our true mission. Here's a story for you. A pastor once brought about 10 people onto stage at his church and gave them roles to play on an imaginary fire truck. One person was assigned to drive, another got to control the siren, one person manned the hose, and one guy turned that strange little steering wheel at the back of the truck. And after getting them all in place, and having them commence their roles, he asked each of them, and what's your purpose again? And each one of them answered by repeating the title of whatever job he had given them. And after they were done, he said, you guys are all wrong, every one of you. Because your purpose, every one of you here, is to put out fires. That's your purpose. And our purpose? is to use our vocation, whatever it might be, our vocation to point others to Jesus. One of my favorite quotes is by St. Francis of Assisi. It's short and it's simple, and that's the way I like things. Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Now let that one sink in. Preach at all times. Use words if you have to, because your actions are going to say more anyway. The scripture Melissa read that today told us, go out and train everyone you meet in this way of life. So let the stories that fill your days, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, point others to Christ. Because each of us is a minister. And may our everyday lives be tools through which God can work. Amen. Um, if you didn't want to call that a sermon, I've heard many sermons over the past almost 40 years. She can preach. <laughs> Would you stand and let's sing Pass It On? <laughs>